Bloop a doop a doo. Bloop a doop a da ba This is my favorite game of all time. I think it's the perfect JRPG. Okay, bye. See you next time. Okay, just kidding. I suppose I'll give an actual review. I'm Michael, and this is my review of Final Fantasy VI. I'm going to try my best to keep this review light on spoilers. If you want to see a deeper dive into story analysis, check out my three analysis videos. Before that, you might want to check out my video on analyzing video game music, or my video with Molly where we talk about the character themes in the game. If you've never played this game before though, this video you're watching now is a good video to start on. Final Fantasy VI was developed and published by Square and released in 1994 for the Super Nintendo. It has since been released for PlayStation, Game Boy Advance, Android, iOS, Windows, Nintendo Switch, and PS4. You have no excuse. I'm ordering you to play this game. This game was directed by Yoshinori Kitase and Hiroyuki Ito, and was produced by series creator Hironobu Sakaguchi. This game had kind of an interesting development. The team started by creating the characters, and then a story was written around them, with the brief that there is no real main character. I will be making the case, though, that there are three characters who, to differing degrees, serve as main characters. This story is fantastic. It deals with power, the nature of power, who gets to benefit from that power, and how power corrupts. Its characters search for meaning, have to learn to accept their pasts, and have to defend what little they have left when things aren't looking so good. The game does play with a lot of tropes, but I don't mind. It does a good job of using these tropes, and there's a big subversion at the end of what I call Act 2 that really puts everything in a different perspective. The world is cohesive, interesting, and vibrant. It really feels like the NPCs in the towns we visit have lives outside of their interactions with the heroes. For instance, Figaro Castle manufactures goods that are sold in South Figaro, and there's a well-established trade route between South Figaro and Nikea. The richest man in South Figaro is up to no good, though. The people in Albrook, which is occupied by the Empire, have to go about their daily lives while in the presence of soldiers who bully them in the streets and who are rowdy in their tavern. The people in the secluded town of Thamasa all behave differently in the presence of visitors. One of the most common complaints that I hear about Final Fantasy VI is the way the section of the game that I call Act 3 works. I admit that the pacing is a bit weaker here, but I think it works from a narrative perspective. Our heroes are lost and struggling. When we play the game, we feel that way too. But the party doesn't give up hope. They fight for what they have left. Plus, most of the character growth that happens in the game is in Act 3. I think that ends up making it really beautiful. The characters in Final Fantasy VI aren't perfect. The roster is a bit bloated, but everyone has their strong points. One of the fun things of having a game with 14 permanently playable characters is if you don't like somebody, you don't have to put them in your party. You can mix and match to make the party you want. That being said, not all of the individual hero characters in the game are great. Instead of introducing these characters in the order we meet them in the game, I'll roughly talk about them depending on how much I like them. I'll start at the bottom of the barrel with Umaro and Gogo. They're both optional characters that you can't pick up until Act 3. There's not much to know about them. They don't have well-defined character traits, and they don't show much growth or development through the short time that we know them. I know there are tons of fan theories about Gogo, but if they're not actually in the game, does it matter? I know Gao can be an incredibly overpowered party member, but I'm talking about how he's written in the story here. His story is very sad for sure, but I don't feel he gets much development. Plus, he's one of my least favorite characters to use in battle, even though I know he can be really useful. Setzer, Mog, Strago, and Realm. Of these four, I think Mog is the weakest character and Setzer is the strongest. I probably could have made Mog a two, but he's just so cute I can't help it. Strago and Realm have some nice story around them, and I like their relationship with each other, but they don't have strong desires other than beating the bad guys. Plus, they don't really change much in the game. Setzer has a bit of development, but it's all pretty short, plus he's just annoying in battle. I actually really like Shadow and Cyan 
but the writing for them just isn't quite strong enough to get them five points. Shadow's really cool, and he's great in battle, but I want just a little bit more from him and his story. Cyan is a really strong character and shows a lot of growth through the game, but I don't like him quite as much as the last characters. Plus, he sucks in battle. Edgar is just barely not a five. He's a beast in battle and he has a really well-developed character, but he undergoes almost no change. By the way, I'm basing this on his original SNES cartridge translation into English. He's a bit less likable in other translations, but he's still a well-defined character either way. Edgar's brother, Sabin, is my husband. He doesn't really show much more growth than his brother, but his endless optimism and his comfort expressing his own emotions are so welcome in a JRPG full of stoic and sad characters. He's also a goofball at points, and that levity is welcome. Locke's character arc is so satisfying. Every one of his actions and reactions makes sense when we learn about the tragedy in his past. When that storyline is finally complete in Act 3, and he finds some closure, the new relationship with Celeste that had been developing throughout the game finally feels secure. More on their relationship in a minute. Terra and Celeste are incredibly well-written characters. Their arcs are somewhat mirrored. Terra starts having great power, but not knowing herself and feeling lonely and lost. Before the game, Celeste is very confident in herself and doesn't want help from anyone. As the game goes on, Terra gets the love she needs, and Celeste allows herself to feel the love that's around her. When Celeste loses everything, she's the driving force behind bringing everyone back together to fight the big bad. Locke and Celeste's relationship in Final Fantasy VI is one of the strongest and most believably written in all of video games. Locke starts off feeling a need to protect Celeste. Celeste doesn't trust him at first. Later events make Locke doubt Celeste, and she has to earn that trust back. They can't really be good for each other until Celeste learns to trust and Locke is able to let go of his past. Their character themes and different versions of these themes help tell their stories so beautifully. So out of this cast of 14, who's the main character? The developers wanted there to be no one clear main character. You can make a case for Edgar, he is used to being a leader, and he often makes the decisions that the characters follow to move the game forward, but I wouldn't count him in the running for main character. I like to say that Terra is definitely the main character of Act 1, Celeste is definitely the main character of Act 3, and Locke is sort of the main character of Act 2. Locke becomes the one who makes many of the decisions in Act 2, and he's required in your party for much of it. But a lot of Act 2 deals with finding Terra and many of the important emotional beats for Locke in Act 2 are with Celeste. The big set piece in Act 2 is the famous opera scene, which focuses on Celeste. But I think the strongest case can be made for Terra, if for no other reason than that in games like Dissidia, which take the main character from each game in the Final Fantasy series, Terra is the choice. But also, even when Terra isn't in your party, much of the game is about her. She's also the character we care about the most in the ending credits. But also, there's a trope in JRPGs that the main character wakes up in a bed at the beginning of the game. Who's the character who wakes up in the bed toward the beginning of Act 1, when she's finally acting and thinking for herself? Terra. Locke wakes up in the very same bed at the beginning of Act 2. Celeste wakes up in bed at the beginning of Act 3. I think that solidifies my case that there are three main characters, but mostly Terra. The villains in Final Fantasy VI are similarly mostly very strong. Part of what works so well about them is that there is so much attention given to just Kefka and Gestal. The only other constant thorn in our side is Ultros, and I honestly kind of hate him. Sabin's humor was enough to effectively lighten the tone of the game, but Ultros just ends up feeling odd. Kefka and Gestal, though, they're great. They both want to obtain the ultimate power, but they have different thoughts on what to do with that power. This shared goal with different imagined outcomes causes them to mostly work together, but when they are at odds with each other, the results are catastrophic. 
The important NPCs in Final Fantasy VI are similarly quite strong. We have characters who help explain our heroes' pasts, characters who stand in for big ideas, characters who spur the plot along, and characters who tug our heroes in interesting directions. I'm going to just talk about the five that I feel are most interesting. We only hear about Daryl very briefly, once in a short, optional scene, but it's okay if you miss that, because all of the same beats happen in the plot event centered around her. She seems like a character who'd be really fun to get to know, and I wish we could spend some more time with her. Bannon is interesting. He's ostensibly a good guy, but even though the game doesn't make this evident, I doubt that the methods he has in mind to take down the Empire are much better than the Empire itself. I toyed with either listing Leo as a hero or a villain, He's working for the Empire, but his character helps to show that not everyone from the Empire is evil. He's a good foil for Bannon in that way. Honest question that I don't know the answer to. Is Rachel a girl in the refrigerator? If you don't know the trope, that's when a female character in a story is only there so that her death can spur her male partner to action. I don't think she's quite a girl in the refrigerator, largely because that's not what gets her partner into the action of the game directly, and, if anything, she holds him back from his full participation in the story until he moves on from her. What do you think? I saved Sid for last because I have the spiciest opinion on him. Though everything we see him do in the game is good, and he works to help the good guys, the things he has done in the past are unspeakably cruel and evil. We're supposed to care about him, but I just can't. Diversity and gender balance are often tricky topics in JRPGs, especially the farther back in history we go. When it comes to diversity, I know this game came out in 1994, and it's par for the course. However, Amano's concept art for General Leo makes him pretty clearly a person of color. In game, he looks much less so, and everyone in the game seems to be of the same race. I think Final Fantasy VI does have a pretty good gender balance though. Sure, way more characters are male than not, but the game's two most important protagonists are female, and they're the most fleshed out and well-rounded characters of the cast. There's even one character who does not have a specified gender, and that's cool. I have this set as a 4 out of 5 because, especially for 1994, this game does pretty well on this front. I think, bottom line, these characters feel mostly pretty real. Part of what helps this is that the dialogue is pretty good. It seems, at least to me, to be well translated. The dialogue makes sense for the characters, and they don't all speak the same way. Gotta say though, some of Cyan's Shakespeare-ish lines are not correctly written, but that's not a big enough gaffe for me to think the dialogue and translations are bad. As the last mainline sprite-based Final Fantasy game, Final Fantasy VI's graphics are basically perfect. We don't have any problems with clipping yet, and as this is the last game in the series on the Super Nintendo, they really got the most use out of the hardware and software that they could possibly have. The cutscenes all happen in the regular gameplay engine too, so nothing ends up looking out of place. I love the design of this game. Series regular Yoshitaka Amano is here for the last game in the series where he designed the characters and I think it's his best work. These designs are so strong that you can get a good sense for who the character is in battle, but also who they are as a person from the designs for the most part. The designs for everything, not just the characters, are interesting and they strike an excellent balance between consistent and varied. Nothing sticks out, nothing looks too samey. Just one look at Terra tells you she's a lonely, conflicted young woman. Look how she almost fades into the background behind her clothes. Celeste, by contrast, looks cold and powerful. She's almost always pictured with her sword, but she has little emotion behind her eyes. Locke is wearing lots of stuff treasures he's found on his adventures. Edgar looks appropriately expensive and regal, while Sabin is wearing much simpler clothes, but his muscles really stand out. Not all of those designs translated super well to the sprites, though. In fact, some of them seem to not even reference the design, like Celeste. It's alright, though, because most of them do pretty well, and when they don't, they still look good. The towns and dungeons are especially strong in this game. 
Every town has some sort of gimmick to it, even if that gimmick doesn't show up until Act 3. And the towns look different enough to help tell that story. The dungeons, too, are better than any Final Fantasy game so far. Yes, there are a lot of caves in this game, but they all look and feel pretty different. The dungeons where you take two or three parties and switch between them are especially strong. The monsters, especially the bosses, look fantastic. The different transportation options have a lot of character to them too. I especially like the difference between the two airships. The Blackjack is a party ship full of gambling tables, while the Falcon is much more stripped back. It's just built for speed. The sound effects in Final Fantasy VI are great. No notes. But we have to talk about the music. This is Nobuo Uematsu's best score, in my opinion. Sure, maybe individual tracks from other games might beat out some of these, but this entire soundtrack is the best. Most of the character themes are excellent, especially Terra's theme. Dancing Mad is the best final boss music in the series. I typically make a cover song from each game that I review, and since I've had several videos on Final Fantasy VI, I've had the pleasure of making four different cover songs. I could cover most of this soundtrack and still enjoy doing it. Now for gameplay. Movement feels good in this game. It's never awkward to walk in certain areas. The battles are fun because of the way that each of the 14 main playable characters and two of the extras have special skills that no one else in the game can do. When you're building your party for a mission, do you want Terra's superior magic? Edgar's tools? Sabin's blitz? Yes, you want all of those. Do you want Cyan's sword tech, later renamed Bushido, or Setzer's slots? Well, no, you probably don't want those, but that's okay. There are more characters to play with. I think the learning curve is about perfect. There aren't a ton of systems in this game, just the ones that are character specific and the ones you do with learning magic. We never have too much to tackle at once. The difficulty of this game feels just about perfect for me too. If you've watched my other reviews, you know that that means that the game is not particularly difficult at all, and I like that. All of my picky individual scores I gave the game come to an impressive 97%. I gave this game my own score of a 99%, only a hair away from perfect. If you average those two scores together, this game gets a 98% or an A+. Often when people talk about their favorite JRPGs, you'll hear people mention either Final Fantasy VI or Final Fantasy VII. Everyone who has played both games has a preference between the two. That's only natural. Too many people, though, think you're only allowed to like one or the other. They're both good games. You're allowed to like both of them. I personally much prefer Final Fantasy VI, but not to the point that I think Final Fantasy VII is a bad game. If you like any other JRPGs, I think you owe it to yourself to play Final Fantasy VI. It's not the flashiest game ever, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles that some newer JRPGs have, but this game has a lot of heart and a lot of charm. I personally find these pixelated graphics way more charming than hyper-realistic graphics, or the graphics for some games that tried to do something really ambitious before the game developers were good at it, or the hardware could fully support it. This story, these characters, and the way the design, graphics, music, and gameplay support them all add up to something beautiful. I will forever evangelize for this game. Thanks so much for watching. Do you have any different opinions about anything I said? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to chat with you all. Please give this video a like if you liked it, or please give it a pity like if you didn't like it. And please subscribe if you like what my friends and I do here maintaining group yourselves.